Hi, I'm Stuart Whiting, and welcome to Recovery His Way on the campus of His Way Recovery Center in Huntsville, Alabama. I'm here once again with Tom Reynolds, the director of His Way. Good to be here, Stuart. Good to see you, Tom. So in previous episodes, we've talked about what His Way is and what a typical day for a resident is and some of the components right. of the program. And today I wanted to step back and talk about the approach and the mindset towards recovery that His Way has. I thought maybe the best way to do that would be to start with the mission statement of His Way. Mm -hmm. So can you share with us uh, what that statement is? Right. Well, it says our mission is to reclaim men from a life of addiction, to rebuild their lives in spiritual sobriety in Christ, and to restore them to Christ-like service in the community. So there's really three key elements involved in our um, focus. Yeah, and when I see that mission statement, I, I think the word that jumps off the page from a starting point is the word addiction. Right. And we're a, a recovery center, and that's a buzzword that we see in the news a lot in the addiction um, areas and uh, the, the crisis that is, is happening and has been happening for a long time. So what I'm curious about is how do you see the approach towards addiction here at His Way maybe different than other approaches that are out there and have been out there for a long time. Right. Well, obviously addiction has been with us as long as human beings have been on the planet um, of various kinds. And so um, it's been a struggle. It's been the human struggle, the human um, uh, struggle for ever. Um, and, and so in recent times, I think, you know, with an effort toward really addressing alcoholism and then drug abuse. Um, there's been a number of different approaches. Um, and I think, it, I guess to begin kind of in a short version, um, you know, really beginning, say at the beginning of the 19th century or 20th century, I guess, um, the idea was always viewed that alcoholism particularly was kind of a, a moral failing. Mm -hmm. That coming from our Puritan religious kind of roots as Christians, we just kind of see people as kind of hobos, ingrates, um, irresponsible type people that have a moral problem, that they have caved into some moral failing, and that that's the real focus of the problem. I mean, in almost in, in almost every context in our culture, we have the, the town drunk, for instance, mm -hmm. even Otis Campbell in, in the most idyllic place you could ever live, Mayberry. Um, you have to have the town drunk that becomes a symbol of that type of reflection, that kind of life, that kind of person. Yeah, it's almost that they want to include and to give a nod that, yes, this is an issue, but not really even knowing how to, to right. help deal with that. It's not a focus well, of right, the show. But... Right. I mean, and even in Mayberry, right, it's more of a comic relief. Yeah. I mean, it's really the focus of it is kind of looking at that type of and thing. And he can just dry out and he's good the next day right. and he'll, he'll do better the next time. Right, right. And so I think a lot of um, our upbringing culturally has had that. And I think it still pervades our culture. It's, you know, um, I consistently talk to family members and stuff when we have our family meetings. Um, and, the you know, typically family members don't understand why their loved one has this problem. And if they would just stop, if they would just go to church or get their morals right, if they would just do these right things that somehow those problems would go away. Um, and so that's been, I think, the predominant view of, um, of addiction in our culture. In more recent times, in the 1930s, for instance, um, back when um, Alcoholics Anonymous started um, with Bill W. and Dr. Bob, um, like 1935, um, they had borrowed a lot of ideas from the Oxford group originally back in the, even the 19th century. And, um, and they brought a lot of those Christian values into what became known as Alcoholics Anonymous mm -hmm. and the 12 step program. Um, again, their focus began and they started seeing success in really building community, mm -hmm. you know, building a place where people rally. It was, um, uh, biblically centered type of rallying point at which you just discovered a higher power that was in God and Jesus and those type of things. 
Um, and then it wasn't long after, as soon as pe that started happening, people really, because up to that point, the medical community was kind of really baffled. What do we do with this? Mm -hmm. You know, do we send people to mental institutions? Do you know, what do you, how do you handle this type of thing? There was really no real handle from the medical community. It wasn't until really after AA in the 40s and 50s that the medical community started coming in then and started um, diagnosing things and putting terminology to things and starting to consider it instead of a moral failing, they started pursuing it more as a medical problem. Um, and so I think that, and that happens for a lot of reasons. Um, obviously the medical community is trying to come up with a solution. And, and when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail there, right? You have to find it by the thing you have the off opportunity to, to bring um, help to. So um, they began to find things from a medical point of view um, and and started treating it then more as an illness. Um, so you have a disease model, right. maybe, versus a decision model right. that, oh, you just make the right decision or or no, it's, it's ingrained. It's just like a cancer. And um, so... Um, how have you how have you kind of reconciled and dealt with that within the program? Right. Well, um, you know, with the um, with our program, the way I've seen it is, is, and I'll mention this too. Unfortunately, in just about everything I've ever endeavored, there's always um, there's always conflict within the efforts to help. There's people who are very strongly into um, a Christian viewpoint and a religious viewpoint, and decision viewpoint, using that idea. Um, the things that you just need to make a spiritual decision, you need to be delivered from this and those kind of things. And there's people who say, no, it's a, it's a brain disease similar to cancer or similar to diabetes. And it's something that um, you need to treat medically and that you need medication for it and you need medical treatments and those type of things. And those tend to get at odds with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, one um, sees the other at odds. Now, from my point of view, having been involved with it for a number of years and, and looking at from uh, my Christian worldview too is, is I really see it more that all the moral problem and the medical problem are both kind of more symptoms of the real problem. I think the real problem is the problem that we've always had. It's the problem of a spiritual problem. It's the problem of a, the Bible used the idea of the mind, mm -hmm. um, that um, we have a brokenness within us that we're trying to satisfy in ways um, to, you know, in the world. And, it, you know, obviously alcohol and drugs are part of it, but I mean, we're all pursuing that in some way, whether it's finding it in relationships or finding it in um, possessions or finding it in all these things. We have this obsession with trying to fill this void within our lives with something other than God, which has been going on since the fall. Um, you know, you watch the Israelites do it throughout the Old Testament. You watch um, the people that Jesus is dealing with also deal with those very same issues and trying to Satisfied. One of the things I think is interesting, you know, in the, in fact, I'm teaching it right now in our class on uh, in the mornings, um, is with looking at the Beatitudes. And the fourth Beatitude is, um, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, mm. so they will be filled. Um, they will be satisfied. God promises that if you develop the right appetite, if you develop the, having a passion for the right things, there's a promise from God that that can be satisfied. The um, finding fulfillment in sexual pursuits, finding fulfillment in drug and alcohol pursuits, possessions are consistently unsatisfying, consistently leaving you even hungrier than you were after you pursued it. And that's one of the fundamental problems with drugs, too, is that um, the great struggle that a drug addict has is as they pursue this fulfillment through drugs is the first time they use the drug, they experience this tremendous fulfillment. It's, mm. It fills the void. Um, the unfortunate thing is in the next time they need a little bit more to fill that void because tolerance builds up in your body and over time and after a while um, you can never have enough. And even Paul talks about that in Ephesians. You know, he says that, you know, um, we have a continual lust for more and the body can never be satisfied. That pursuit can never be fulfilled. And I really think it's that spiritual brokenness, that spiritual um, emptiness that drives both the moral bad decisions that we make, as well as I think contributes even um, chemically and biologically to our bodies who are broken as well because of the fall and creates problems that can be described as brain diseases and those kind of things. So um, I think all that fundamentally is rooted around a spiritual source. You made me think of something that probably the, one of the more disturbing things that I've learned in being now around the program for several years is hearing some of 
our residents talk about when they first were started taking like opioids in particular. And the terminology they'll use, the wording is, I now found my purpose for life, that right. this, this sensation, this feeling, um, now I knew that all I wanted to do was to pursue that. And wow, how, again, it's a very disturbing and, and sobering kind of thought that a chemical can do that. And, but it also, I guess, points back to why were you in need of this, you know, pursuit in life where you needed to be fulfilled through this kind of, you know, this, this sensation right. and what was missing in your life or what was maybe a part of your life that was so detrimental that was leading you to search for something. Right. One of the, one of the things that's exciting about being involved in recovery ministry is that um, every addict has been pursuing their purpose. Mm -hmm. They've been pursuing, you know, so many people get so wrapped up in life. They're not even aware that there's an emptiness within them that they're trying to fulfill. Um, addicts are very aware of that emptiness and they're very, uh, very despairing about the fact that they haven't been able to fill it. And so by coming to his way and hearing the gospel and hearing the messages, the, the, the Christ center messages, it really begins. I mean, they already have an appetite for it. They already mm -hmm. have a hunger and thirst mm -hmm. to hear these things because they, as I tell them all the time, I mean, you, you have the a perfect attitude to embrace the gospel. You've just been kind of pursuing the wrong thing to do it because you know, there's an emptiness, you know, that you're craving something, you know, you're trying to find purpose. All those things are already evident, whether you're chasing opioids or whether you're chasing alcohol or whatever to fulfill it. And so this creates, I think, a great appetite. So when they come in, because for so long in ministry, for me, when I tried to share the gospel with people, um, I had to convince them they were looking for something before I then mm -hmm. could show them what they're looking for. Right. Here, these guys walk through knowing they're looking for something. There's no question about it. And so the opportunity then to simply share with them what, is really going to bring satisfaction, fulfillment for them is really the focus. Yeah, to that point, I wonder if some of te Jesus' is teaching about like, it's harder for the rich man to enter heaven is because the rich man is, you know, life's easy, life's fulfilled. And, you know, it's, I I'm not going to be reaching outside of myself and seeking for something because everything's very comfortable. Right. And I, and one thing that's gone through my mind in the last few years is we have a community and I was one and still am in a lot of ways of, comfortable Christians who have a routine, who life is fine for, they don't feel a lot of brokenness, and um, maybe that we're deceiving ourselves and that we've replaced, you know, that kind of comfort for a real pursuit of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I, I appreciate what you're saying here, that we all need to capture this understanding of our own brokenness and our need for true fulfillment and, and not something that's temporary uh, or that's, um, you know, that's going to fall short of of that, of that eternal kind of purpose that, that we need. And, you know, to that end, I know we message a lot to our Christian community that here's a place where you can discover that because as you help and are involved with men who are on this path, you can find a great outlet for your own faith to, to show itself and, and learn um, this, this real fulfillment scene. I've certainly experienced that a lot. And there's a great deal of joy, as you said, and one of the great things in being a part of a ministry like this is, we get to be on the front lines in this in this way of seeing um, the joy that comes with discovering uh, the true purpose and fulfillment, which is really um, it's really a great great thing to be a part of. Right. Yeah. One of the things with addiction, you know, that happens. I think I had a quote I used the other day that just um, addiction is when the consumer becomes consumed, and I think one of the things that happens is you start out with using a product for your benefit, but after a while that product begins to control you and you now live for that product, whatever that is. Um, and that's what really happens, that subtle shift happens in addiction when you can no longer put it down, when you can no longer, it, it now calls your name, it, it summons you and it calls everything out of you. In fact, you know, one of the things, um, one of the definitions of addiction um, that comes from the medical model is addiction is a chronic relapsing neuro neurobiological disease characterized by compulsive use despite negative consequences. I think mm -hmm. that's interesting. Despite the negative consequences. And addicts, particularly in our society, experience a lot of negative consequences. They lose, you know, families, they lose jobs, they lose possessions, they go through car accidents, they um, sometimes jeopardize their lives, they end up incarcerated, and all these negative consequences. And yet, 
the first thing they do when the, the when they're out of the hospital is they go right back or, or, or as soon as they're out of the jail they go right back and that's a part of the addiction is that we we're it's now calling us it now controls us we don't we're not um, deciding it it's deciding us um and i think that's um critically important to understand addiction in all its forms because it's not again not just drugs and alcohol many people who've never been in a recovery program are struggling with addiction in various kinds yeah you even see it in ways that are um very surprising i think to us that you know our our cell phones right, right. becoming there's there's quite a bit of literature now about how uh generations that were raised with a screen in front of them and how that changes them and you mentioned chemically you know it's the same thing that it, it changes how they think and and what their expectations are and fulfillment. And most of that literature that I've seen is quite scary of mm -hmm. what the long-term ramifications of, of being so tethered to a device that has a lot of great benefit and utility. And we have two of them sitting right here. And, right. Um, and so again, bringing a different mindset. So what is that, what is what you're trying to do in the program to bring a different mindset that is outside of maybe just make a better decision come on, wake up, make a better decision, just say no, or that, hey, we just got to get the right medical treatment. So where, what's at the heart of what's happening within the His Way well, approach? It's right. Well, I think it, it comes back to the gospel again. It comes back to one, recognizing there's this tremendous sense of brokenness that's in all of our lives because of sin, because of the fall, that um, this world is not the way God intended it to be. This mm. And I, us, we are not the way. Um, in fact, it was, I was talking to our guys just the other day that um, the fact that we are that we that we want things to be different is an inclination, an indication to us that God's image is certainly within us. That we envision a life that should be different than this one, mm -hmm. which is true. God's bred that into us. God has created that within us. Um, and then the question is, how do I go about? discovering that life and really experiencing that life. And it really comes to a real transformation of how we think and how we see ourselves. A lot of things are involved, but identity is a big part of it. Really ident discovering a new identity and who I am and those type of things are really important. Um, it's not about decisions as much as it's about understanding identity, I think, mm -hmm. and understanding who, where you really, what you're living out of and what that real purpose is. Um, and I think one of the things I've seen a lot along that line is to constantly remind that we are made in the image of God, mm -hmm. <laughs> that we uh, have an inherent worth and value. And my guess is a lot of the guys in their life experience have not felt that they've been very worthy or valuable um, in their, maybe within their family group or within the way their friend groups quote unquote friend groups and they because I hear the stories of well I kind of thought I had friends but you know they're really just using me right. and um, to be able to really convey and, and and put that thought that you you have eternal worth and in, in merit just because of the creation is, is really important right and I, I think along with that Stuart which I think is a really great point is that you know, at his way, what I really have a car, strong conviction about is that message has to be embedded in every Everything. part of the experience. Right. It can't be just go to Bible class and hear this for an hour and then go back to being disrespected and mistreated and those right. kind of things. It's important that even our staff and our communication with our guys is that we treat them with respect, that we treat them with inherent value and those kind of things. Because it's easy um to, you know, you get a number of guys here and they become a number and you're just trying to herd cats and, you know, you treat them, it's easy to fall into those traps right. in which you end up treating them just like they get treated in the prison system or on the street corners or maybe in their broken family environments. Um, but we're going to treat them differently. We're going to treat them with respect. I mean, I find myself a lot of times even referring to them by Mr. Their Last Name, yeah. just because that becomes part of my habit. Part of, to be honest, part of it is so that because I do money with guys, and so I need to remember alphabetically who they are, and so I use their last symbol as a trigger for me, just to remind myself. But it also just, I think, is important that it conveys respect, and that mm -hmm. these guys aren't just, you know, I, for instance, I feel very strongly, I don't give nicknames to people, because I think that can be disrespectful, because now I'm naming you, mm -hmm. instead of allowing your inherent identity mm -hmm. to, in a sense, tell me what you're named. And I think, again, all those things contribute to the idea of respect, um, dignity, 
those type of things I think are critically important that it's not just about hearing it in a Bible class or reading a Bible right. verse about it. It's about being it's about being treated that way throughout the day, all day long, in the van and at the job and every place you go, you're gonna be treated with that same Yeah, and I've even seen it with when discipline happens and kind of the ultimate form of that when we have to uh, let a guy go because, you know, he's failing a drug test or just have done some egregious violations. There's even a respect in the way that's handled and a disposition of here's how you can return, you know, after a period and not just we're done with you, get out of here, we never want to see you again. Right. And that, that I think that speaks very highly of the relationships that are being built and also leads to a lot of those guys wanting to come back. And after, and, and I know, you know, you've interviewed John Brown just last week and, and that, and he was one that went through two cycles of that. Right. But, but when he decided he really wanted to reach out for recovery, this is the place he wanted to be because he realized this is a place that had his best interest in mind. Right. For that. And, and I think it's important. I think you make a great point there because even when a guy violates fundamental rules and, and can do it, as you said, egregiously, I mean, do it, I mean, you know, we've had guys, you know, that are literally harming other people in the program. We still treat them respectfully. We do everything we can to make sure that they have a good landing spot when they leave here. You know, we'll drive them where they need to be driven to. We'll make the phone call that needs to be made for them. We, you know, we'll help them pack up their stuff. We'll do whatever we can do to help them. And, and while we tell the guys who leave not to be contacting the current residents because we don't want to harm those current guys' recovery, the staff is always available to them to help them out, to give them direction, to, you know, help help them and love them and respect them because they're still res- worthy of that as an identity, um, in spite of the fact that maybe they haven't complied with all our rules or aren't, you know, really ready for recovery. Um, yeah. You know, in the program here. Yeah. Okay. So beyond identity, what else um, is kind of in the mindset as you you know taking guys on this journey towards? a spiritual, you know, recovery? Well, I think it's it's really focused, instead of on performance things, it's really focused on relational things, mm-hmm. building a relationship, having intimacy with God, having intimacy with Christ, knowing that the Holy Spirit can is going to be doing a work in your life. And, and the real word that we use a lot around here is transformation. Mm-hmm. That it's talking about, we're talking about not just, because I think a lot of times it's just, it's just kind of making decisions. It's kind of just, we're going to just kind of, fake it till we make it. We're going to put on this little cloak of Christianity and kind of look Christianly and that everything looks nice. And that's not what we're interested in doing. We're interested in really working from the inside out. And really, my belief is if you fill them up, I mean, there's, they have to detox. And, and obviously, level one of detoxing is detoxing from whatever drugs are on, alcohol they're on, that kind of stuff. But the reality is they're still sick. Even once all the substances are out of their life, they still have a detox thing to go through mm. and a matter of getting rid of the old stereotypes, the old imagery, the old language, the old, I mean, all that stuff. And so instead of chastising them for those external things, what we're trying to do is really fill them up with the new things. So in a sense, as, as God's spirit and the truth of God begins to be infused in them, those detox things just kind of start spilling out of the top and mm. they get kind of gotten rid of along the way. We don't worry about that as much as worry about making sure they're filling up with the transformative message of the gospel. One of the first things I ever remember you saying about the His Way program when you were coming on board and, you know, I knew you then, but I wasn't a part of this, was you really felt strongly that the addict doesn't need to be tethered to their identity as an addiction, uh, as an addict. Right. And yes, that's always going to be a truth for them. But I love that idea of tethering because the tether only allows you to go so far away from that anchor point, but rather trying to give this new purpose, new identity, and also this new feeling and what's overflowing uh, and hope going away from that. Um, Again, not forgetting it, but you really can never move beyond if you always define yourself by the addiction. And, you know, it makes me think of a lot of Paul's writings where he's he talks about putting off. Yes, there's a put off, but there's the putting on and clothing yourself with this newness in Christ. And it can just completely transform you. And the focus on those passages is not how you used to be. Yes, that's a given. It's what are you going to be now going forward? And that's clearly all throughout this program. And it's really um, obvious how impactful that is. And, and one of the things I think is important in this transformation process of realizing and becoming aware of what the 
real goals are here. You know, it's easy. All of our guys, you know, generally stay off of substances. Mm -hmm. And and that's a success, obviously, within itself. But one of the things that I think is important in this program is that we don't define sobriety necessarily by just the abstinence of alcohol or drugs. It's a lot deeper than that. In fact, Paul decri- describes um, sobriety in First Thessalonians as a spiritual alertness, mm-hmm. no longer being in darkness, but being in light, no longer being slumbering, but being awake. Um, so stay awake, stay alert, those kind of things. That's sobriety. And it's a spiritual state of mind. It's not just a abstinence of a substance or the you know the withdrawal, withdrawing yourself from some influence. It's far beyond that. Now, certainly, the withdrawal from the influence is a step toward that it's direction. Right. But it's not the end game. The end game is a is a deeper spiritual transformative type of thing that that totally changes how I see myself, how I see the world, the lens through which I um, view the world. One of the illustrations I've used many times with our guys, and I use it from hunting, even though I'm no hunter, never been hunting in my life, but having listened to stories of hunting, um, I always share with them, you know, if you are, say, in one tree stand where somebody else is in another tree stand, and somebody signals to you that there's a deer over in the thicket over there, but you can't see it, you look down your sight, you can't see it, you can trust the other person and just kind of fire blindly into the thicket, hoping to hit a deer, right? Which is obedience. You know, I listened to them. I heard what they said and that kind of thing. But, but the real goal would be to be able to see what they see down the site that they see it. And then you can have one sharp target shot toward exactly what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times in our relationship with God and even study of scripture, we kind of fall to this well, I'm just going to be obedient. God says do it, I'm just going to do it, which isn't a bad thing to do. But ultimately, the goal is to, through Scripture, begin to see life from God's vantage point so that I'm looking down His sight lines, I'm seeing through His scope, and then I can simply respond to life because it's clear what the answer is. It's clear what I'm supposed to be. And I think a lot of that is what real sobriety is about. Mm-hmm. It's about seeing it from that point of view. And that's not just a a, a drug addict issue. That's a human issue. That's right. That's right. And we all need that. We all need to be in the scriptures, not just check off a box and say, yeah, I read my Bible today, Mm -hmm. but how am I really allowing this vantage point to mold how I view life? And then ultimately, because I'm going to act based upon how I see it. So if I see something accurately, I'll act accurately. But if I see it improperly, I'm going to act improperly. Mm. And my experience has been some of the guys that have come through the program who are still deeply involved that have clearly moved from uh, the addiction mindset to this spiritual alertness, man, they, their passion and their enthusiasm and they're just 100% in on a life that is geared towards, you know, following Jesus and, and not just in the way you're talking, just, okay, be obedient in the religious sense, but also the way they pour out of themselves and giving back to others and with their money and with their time and their full investment, it's actually quite humbling to maybe the, again, this comfortable Christian model is the word I think of who, you know, life's pretty good. There's not a lot of brokenness in their family or in their, their own life otherwise. And, you know, just, you know, I've, yeah, I'm obedient. And, and yet if I look from the outside and I say, are you really passionate about this? Is this something that actually changes your life in any in any perceivable way, and because it maybe really haven't dealt with this this transformation that we all need to go through. I know that one of the popular passages that I hear the guys use a lot is from Romans 12, 1 and 2, and that transforming of the mind. And again, when I see a guy that has done that, it's inspiring. And it's, uh, again, humbling to uh, to think, is that something that I really experience in my own life? And, and I'm knowing that, that I need to. Um, and so... Uh, it's beautiful when we see it uh, come through, and I know it doesn't always come through for every every guy. And I know ultimately that's not something that you can just put on someone. You can't just make someone um, go through that transformation. That that's the part of faith and and a response that has to take place. And yet I think here you're creating an environment in the staff and the program of where uh, the willing soul can make that choice and make it in with good confidence that there's um, a purpose 
in in starting a path maybe that they had given up on or never heard about even. Mm -hmm. And uh, they start to see the fruit of the Spirit working in their life. And that's, if we believe in the truth of the gospel and we believe in the message that uh, that we wear the name Christian, then maybe it, I shouldn't be so surprised at how effective it is when the gospel comes into the life of someone because that's what the promise is of the gospel. Right, absolutely. That's absolutely great. That's true. Well, I, this has been a really good um, talk about the spiritual kind of approach. And I know that'll keep coming up in different episodes so, um, and we're going to continue to dive into other parts of the mission statement, and hopefully we'll be able to really share with everyone um, a full breadth of, of what we're doing here, because this really is just starting from, you know, what we're trying to accomplish, but then there's more in how we help people um, as they start to buy into, yes, this is the right approach. So we'll just keep on talking about this over the next few weeks. All right? I look forward to it. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. So. If you'd like any more information about His Way, we invite you to visit our website at hiswayinc.org.